my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. In Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord. He's the Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. It never gives up, 
There we go. There we go. I turned it off. What's the problem? All right. Well, we just again, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to Turnaround Church. I'm so excited about what God is doing here. All of you that are online watching, we're so excited to have you with us. And uh, if this is your first time, we're so happy that you've joined us. If you would, do us a favor. And in the comments or in the description of the video is a link to our website, turnaround.church, and click the I'm New card and fill out that information and let us know that you're watching. Let us know who you are. We'll send you a free gift. And we just want to let you know that we're so grateful that you're watching. And so we're glad to have you with us this morning. All right. I want to uh, spend a, a, a minute or two. First of all, uh, I want to let you know we've got a pastor's wife in our church in early, uh, early Texas. And she has been diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. And so they had thought they had handled it. They had her on some treatment, just pills, not, not any uh, chemo. So no chemo, but for some reason she's been having a hard time and she, they had to take her to the doctor, uh, to the hospital uh, Friday and she couldn't breathe and that sort of thing. So we need to lift her up and uh, her name is uh, Maxwell, Anita Maxwell. 
So we need to keep lifting her up and praying for her. She is in a, a desperate shape, and so we want to remember her. Friday, I was up at the church, and um, I had a meeting, and then after the meeting, I just kind of I turned on the, uh, the video up st on here, and I've got some soaking music that I listen to. It's on YouTube, and so it's just music. It's not any specific songs, but it's just soaking music, and I turned the lights off, and I was praying, and I was praying for all of you guys, and I found out these, these, this altar bench is really, really hard on my elbows. It hurts. <laughs> so I did a lot of praying and pacing. So I was praying for each one of you, lift, lifting you up in prayer. And I began to pray uh, for the city. And I called them in from the north, south, east, and west. And the Lord began to show to me that there it was a darkness over this church. And everybody I talk to in this town, everybody that I meet in this town, nobody knows we're here. And that could be because we're back off the road. We've got trees. Uh, the, the rock kind of blends in with all the rest of it. The rock on the building kind of blends in with the rest of everything. But I believe it's a spiritual thing. I believe there is, as I was praying, I was praying for that darkness. And then all of a sudden, I saw over the front of the property, I saw this huge, huge veil that's over the front of the property, like a curtain that's covering it. And so I began to come against that veil, and I began to declare that that veil was torn from the top to the bottom, just like the veil was rent in the temple. Uh, when Jesus died, God tore the, temple, tore the veil and that separated man from God. I believe that that veil, I began to pray that that thing would be destroyed, that the glory of God would begin to just glow from this place, that it would be like a tractor beam that would just draw people in. They would see the glory of God on this place. And I mean, I was having myself a time Friday night just begin to declare that God is going to draw them in and he's going to, there's going to be an attraction there. There's going to be something happening. And I, that darkness is broken. That thing that was over this property is broken. Um, and I, I'm not saying why it was here. I just saw it was here. And that veil is destroyed and no longer, in fact, people are no longer going to see all the little signs over, all the little flags and stuff going over here and all the signs over there. They're going to see our property and they're going to see it and they're going to be drawn to it. And so I just wanted to declare that and let you know that that's what's happening. So I want you to join in with me and agree with me on that thing because I know God has a purpose for us. God has a purpose for this church existing in Cedar Park. He had a purpose for Owen Bowden putting a church here when there was nothing here. He had a purpose. This was, a, this was the country. This was, there was nothing around us. Um, the the J&J Barbecue was just a house. And so there was really nothing around us here. Walmart hadn't come. Nobody had come. And I'm just here to tell you there was a reason why God had him plant it in 1979. And we are here to fulfill that purpose. And we are declaring that purpose. I'm here to tell you COVID hasn't stopped it. COVID hasn't stopped it. It is, it is happening. The enemy's trying to destroy the church with all this that's going on. But I'm here to tell you the church is the answer. And God is going to start using the church. And he's going to start bringing, uh, bringing it out and letting people see us. And he's going to see us. Now, we're not going to stay inside the walls. We're going to start going out uh, like we already sponsored that, that uh, golf tournament. So people, there's some people. There's at least 150 people that have a little cup that have our name on it. I need to show you all those cups. I forgot to show you the cup, but there's a, all the golfers got a bag with a cup that says, turn around church on it. So they all, those people know it, know about us. And uh, so we're going to be doing some more things like that. And I believe God has got some things going on and then we're just going to reach them. We're going to reach out to them. I'm actually in the process of, I just started a book that I really felt like God wanted us to kind of, uh, kind of start adopting this philosophy. So I'm in research stages and stuff of that. So we'll talk more about that later. All right, well, if you have your Bibles with you or your device or just want to look up on the screen, we're, I was praying about, uh, I was just kind of praying, and I felt God, like God wanted me to go to James chapter 3. Now, see, this has to be a miracle because I, I don't, now, this, don't, this is not blasphemous, but I really don't care for the book of James because it's the one that says, count it an opportunity to rejoice when you fall into trials and temptations. When hard times come, consider it a party. I mean, really? And then, we're, as we're going to read here, it's like James was coming down on all kinds of stuff. James being the half-brother of Jesus, and he didn't believe Jesus, most scholars believe that he didn't believe Jesus was actually the Messiah until 
Jesus came into his ministry. So he grew up in the same house with Jesus, but didn't believe that he was the Messiah until he started coming into his ministry and seeing the miracles that were happening, seeing what was going on, and James became, and then he became a leader after Jesus was crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended to the Father. He became a leader in the church, and he's the one when they came to, uh, when Paul and, and Barnabas came back from their trips, and they had seen Gentiles saved, seen Gentiles converted, they came back to Jerusalem to report this, and a lot of people said, no, 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 no. See, they need to become Jews. They can't stay Gentiles and follow the way. They've got to become Jews. I mean, so much so that they need to be circumcised. All the men, all the grown men need to be circumcised. <laughs> and some of them going, going, uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. I didn't know it was all that. But see, it was James that stood up while they were talking about that. James stood up and he said, listen, this is what we ought to do. We should not require them to become what we are. We, are, we have been ruled by the law for so many years, though we have been freed from the law, we still, they were still Jews. You know, like I said, Paul never wasn't converted. Paul became a completed Jew. In other words, he was still Jewish. He still uh, knew the laws. He still obeyed a lot of the laws, but he didn't sacrifice anymore. He didn't do all but he, he knew the, the Messiah had come. So he wasn't converted from Judaism. He became a completed Jew. And so these guys, James stood up and said, let's don't do that for them. Let's just say, okay, keep from eating uh, impure meat. He said, don't uh, do, have, do uh, sexual immorality. Keep from sexual immorality and one other thing. And then said, you'll be good. So they sent the letter out. So this is the same James talking about that. And I'm just going to go through and kind of talk about the whole chapter here because I was reading it. But we're going to find some good things in this. So I'm going to just do verse 1 right now. And in the New International Version, it reads like this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And as I begin to meditate on that, you're going to be judged, you're going to be scrutinized and criticized by men, and you're going to be judged by God. So um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to read here 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 through 33, so just stay where you are in James, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So in 1 Corinthians, hold on, Paul says, I have the right, so he didn't say this, but he, he was talking to some people, to the Corinthians, he said, you say, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of consciousness. Conscious. Conscience. Get the right word in a minute. For the earth is the Lord's and, the f and everything in it. He's quoting Psalms there. So he said, listen, that's okay. You guys say you can do anything. But he said, listen, it's not everything is profitable. Not everything is beneficial. He said, now, if you go to the meat market and you want a certain piece of meat, just get it. Get it and eat it. Don't worry about it. All right? But then verse 28 says, but if someone says to you, this... No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. Verse 27. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go eat whatever is... And you want to go... Okay, let me slow down. I'm trying to hurry. So, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever you, is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But, if someone says to you, this has been offered and sacrificed, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. Okay? I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denouncing, denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as, I try, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. So what he's saying is, listen, 
you can do whatever you want to do, but you've got to remember who's around. See, I have freedom. I have made, God has made me free from the curse of the law. God has freed me from having to, to live by all those rules and those laws. But the thing is, if I am around an unbeliever or someone that believes that way, then if I partake in it and they know I know I'm partaking in it, then I'm going to cause them to stumble. Or I'm going to cause a problem. See, growing up, we, we did this. My, my dad, we grew, up in, we grew up in the Pentecostal Church of God and the denomination we're in, and most of the churches that we were affiliated with believed that women couldn't wear pants, women couldn't wear makeup, they believed, you know, all these kind of things, but my father did not believe that. In fact, my sister wore shorts because she was a basketball player. She was an aggressive basketball player. But she, got to, she wore shorts because it looked silly out there in culottes playing basketball. Okay? So he let us do that. So the, the, we were free. We could do all those things. However, whenever we went to fellowship with them, went to their churches, we dressed according to their their beliefs because we did not want to cause them to stumble okay so this is what paul is saying he's listen you you're free to do what you want to do but you've got to consider other people there are so there's so many pastors and people that that got a revelation on the freedom that they don't think about the conscience of those that they are around they don't think about the people that are seeing them they just say i'm free to do anything and they do they go usually they'll go to an extreme on that freedom. But what they're not considering is there when you're in leadership because James said it here, don't not, you shouldn't become a teacher because you're going to be scrutinized because you have to live at a different level. And though you want to or not when, when you're a pastor or when you're a leader in the church, but even as a Christian, we have to live at a different level because we have a standard to uphold. We have to consider other people. So this is what James was saying. So that is being scrutinized by man but when judge when you're judged by god matthew chapter 18 jesus says if you cause one of these little ones to stumble who believe you might as well have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown yourself into the sea now millstone was a big old stone that they rolled over grain to, to crush it to make flour he said if you cause one of these little ones to stumble that believe you might as well just tack put that millstone around your neck and throw off into the sea because you are causing them to lose their, their, their salvation. You're going to cause them to stumble, cause them to lose their place in eternity, and that woe be to you. But we don't live in fear. We don't live in fear. We, we live our life knowing that we have a standard, knowing that we have to live a certain way, knowing that we're free. We can do things, but we have to understand we don't live in fear about it, okay? All right, so now verse 2. Verse 2 of James chapter 3. I love this. I've, I even underlined this. We all stumble in many ways. James says, we all stumble. James is hard-nosed, but he said, listen, we all stumble. I mean, he even, he even is the one that says, if, you know, dear little ones, I write unto you that you sin not, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. He's not that hard-nosed, okay? But then he goes on to say, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And my little comment is, yeah, right. Yeah, right. We don't have to sin. We don't have to, to fall, but we do, okay? I'm not one of those that says you have to sin every day because then you don't need to trust me, okay? <laughs> I believe we, can, we don't have to sin. We, don't, we, we, we can live a life without sin, but we will fail sometimes because we're human, because we, we have these problems sometimes. But the thing is, is he, what he's saying, he said, listen, we all stumble, and if you say that you don't stumble and you don't stumble, then you're perfect. But then he goes on to verse 3. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So he's laying some groundwork here. So we can put a bit, so it's got a, uh, just a metal piece that goes in their mouth like here, and that whole 1,200-pound animal will move by what you do with that bit. Okay? Verse 4, or take ships for an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So he's, he's, he's setting us up here. 
He's setting us up. So a bit can make a 1,200-pound animal move. A little small rudder can make a large ship move. Verse 5, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. So these wildfires they're having in California that are huge, that are destroying people's homes, that's just immense and they can't get a control over it, it was started by one little thing. Nobody took a, a, a blowtorch out there and set that fire. Somebody either intentionally set it or somebody threw a cigarette out or somebody let a campfire get out of control. Something happened. Something small happened that caused that whole thing to blossom. So he's saying, listen, something real small can have such a great effect. And he's talking about the tongue. Verse 6, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now he's getting hard. Now he's coming down hard. All right? And this is one of the reasons why I stayed away from James, because he come down hard. He come down hard. All right? Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Who don't we feel good about ourselves now? This is a shouting ser sermon right now. With the tongue, verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Now let me stop for a minute. I put this in after verse 8, and I opted not to read it, but I believe it. I want to do it now. Proverbs chapter 18. So we, we hear him saying the tongue is evil, the tongue is bad. This is, it does all, sets all kinds of fire and blah, 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 all this stuff. But Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So Proverbs is telling us the same power that the tongue has. He's not being as harsh as this is, but we've got to understand, we have power in our tongue. Basically, that's just a, a deal for saying our words have power. Yes. Our words have power. Now, in a minute, I'm going to tell you how powerful they are. So let's go on down to verse 10. Out of the same mouth came, pr come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. In other words, we should say, let our yes be yes and our no be no. We should not be two-faced. We should not be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. It said, how long can you halt between two opinions? In the scripture, that verse there, in the, the Indian Bible, in the East Indian people from India, their Bible, it says, how long can one man stand in two boats? That gives you a picture right there. At some point, you're going to get wet. If you try to stand in two boats, at one time you're going to get wet. You're going to get sunk in. So what he's saying is, you should not speak good and evil out of the same mouth. You know, it's like mom used to say, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. I'm going to try to clean that rascal up. All right, so verse 11. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdoms. Okay, so he's giving us a little, little something to deal with here. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic for where you have envy and selfish ambition there you find disorder and every evil practice 17 but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure then peace loving considerate submissive full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere and verse 18 says, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So he is telling us 
that our tongue is a powerful instrument. Our words are powerful. And what motivates those words, what he's trying to tell us is we've got to let what motivates those words be pure. We've got to let the, what motivates those words be wise. We have got to let God make us wise. James also says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the Father, and he will give it to you liberally, and he will not upbraid, upbraid you. In other words, he's saying he won't chide you. He won't say, why are you asking for wisdom? Why are you? He doesn't say that. He gives it to you liberally, the Scripture says. We have wisdom. Now, I wrote this morning, I was praying this morning after studying and stuff. I was praying this morning, and I posted on Facebook that God showed me this picture. He says, just as a pressure cooker in, decreases the length of time for cooking of food... So it takes the, the time that it takes to cook food and shortens it. He said, so the pressures of this life are here to accelerate your maturation process. In other words, to mature you faster. And you gain wisdom and understanding quicker with the pressures of this life. That's what they're supposed to do for you. He doesn't give us the pressures of life, but what he does is he uses the pressures of this life to mature us quicker to give us wisdom quicker to give us understanding quicker and i said lean into that pressure don't let the pressure destroy you don't let the pressure cause evil to come out of your mouth but let wisdom come out of your mouth because the power of life and death are in the tongue so we've got to say so my title is what did you say what did you say so we've got to understand god has taught us God taught us the power of our words. See, God knows the power of our words because if you go to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, remember, we're created in the image and after the likeness of God. And we have His Holy Spirit inside of us, okay? We have His Holy Spirit. Now, James is saying this is after Acts chapter, this is uh, before the Acts chapter 2 happened. So he's taught, not, he didn't know anything about being filled with the Holy Spirit yet. No, 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 I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It was after, after the Pentecost, day of Pentecost. It was after. So he's talking about a spirit-filled person. But see, God is showing us in the beginning because in verse 1 of Genesis, the very book, first verse of the Bible, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface. So, okay, it was formless. Let's get this picture. The earth was formless. Okay? There was nothingness there. And it was empty. Nothing had ever been created. There was, it was just, and it was in chaos. The King James Version says, and it was chaos covered the face of the deep. And so what do we do if we see that? Say, boy, it's dark out here. That's what we do. Our natural reaction to that is, man, it's dark. Out. Man, look at all the chaos. There's so much chaos. Oh, the chaos. Oh, the chaos, the chaos. Oh, look at what. It's just so bad. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. God didn't do that. See, the Spirit of God is hovering over the situation. He's waiting for instructions. The Holy Spirit is waiting for instructions from the, vo the, the voice of God. Remember in John 1.1 1, 1 it says, and in, the, in the beginning the Word was, with, was God, the Word was with God, and so it became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word of God. So the Father is the one that conceives it. Jesus is the one that speaks it, and the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it happen. So the Holy Spirit, we have ministering angels that are waiting. The Scripture says they are waiting for us. to. They beckon at our call, waiting for us to declare what God wants to happen, to declare what needs to happen on the earth. I mean, I told you, in Job it says that nothing will happen on this earth without a man declaring it. When you declare a thing, it will happen. So what, G, what God did is He stepped out on the balcony of heaven and looked into that darkness, and He said... Let there be. Yes. Yes. Then God said. Mm -hmm. He used the power of his words to initiate the Holy Spirit moving into action. Yes. This is where James is saying, listen, we've got a powerful tool at our, at our resource. We've got a, a powerful tool in our toolbox. We have our tongue. And our tongue can speak life or death, Proverbs says. We can speak life into a situation or we can speak death into a situation. We have to consider what we're going to say. We can't just be loose with our tongue, just say whatever we want to say. We have to be, as children of God, as the authorities on this earth, we have to speak what God wants us to say, and so we have to consider it. So verse 3, God said... Verse 
6, then God said. Verse 9, then God said. Verse 14, then God said. Verse 20, then God said. Verse 24, then God said. Verse 26, then God said. We have to let our mouth be full of wisdom. We have to let our mouth be full of the Holy Spirit and declare into this earth what we want it to happen and the Holy Spirit is waiting and all of a sudden He's activated and He goes about making it happen. Now I'm not saying we're all powerful and we just say whatever we want to say and it happens. I'm saying when we speak according to the will of God then the Holy Spirit is ready there to give us, to make it happen. And this is really cool. This is really cool. When we're talking about the Holy Spirit, see the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. We get it confused because we say the Holy Spirit, and so it's like an like inanimate object, but it's, it's Holy Spirit. He's an individual. He's the third part of the Godhead. He is God. It's God's Spirit. So the Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit connects with God to find out the will of God he, he is God, and so he, then he speaks the will of God through us, and when we speak in tongues, he's actually praying the will of God through us. So God, is, when we allow him, speaks through us to declare what should happen. Whether we declare it in tongues or we declare it in English. English is not the, the uh, language of the, of the spirit world, okay? Just understand that that's our language. That's our human language. But when we speak in the Holy Spirit, when we declare through the Holy Spirit, we are speaking into, God, into the atmosphere. And so that's what I was doing Friday. I was speaking into the atmosphere. I, I began to just speak in tongues, begin to pray in tongues, just begin to declare that that veil that God had shown me, that veil that was covering the front of our property, going from... from Property line to property line. And it was probably about 60 feet tall where nobody could see past it. All of a sudden, I just begin to declare that thing is ripped from the top to the bottom. See, I couldn't do it. That's why I say, God, I declare that thing is ripped from the top to the bottom because it's not in my efforts and your. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been waiting for us to declare what He wants to accomplish on this earth. God will not do something unless we declare it. Amen? Without God, we can't, and without us, He won't. It's not original, but I just think it's really good. Without God, we can't, and without us, He won't. Because He has given us authority over this earth, and He's waiting for us to declare what needs to happen on this earth. And if we're in tune with the Spirit, if we let the wisdom of God motivate us, if we let His 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 Holy Spirit began to, to let us know and that understanding and that, that knowledge that, that we understand what God wants on this earth. We understand His Spirit and His nature. We may not know specifically what He wants, but we know His nature. We know His nature. We know that God wants... He said it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we know that fact. We can just mark that down. That's it. That we know we can pray that one. God, we, we know that it's your will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God, I just call them in. I just speak that all are called to repentance. All, everybody's called to repentance. Now, is everybody going to repent? The Scripture says no. But that doesn't stop us from calling it. doesn't stop us because we're going to get some. Amen? There's a doctrine called election that... There's only certain people that are, that are going to get saved. God has already picked out who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. And my thing is, is why even evangelize then if God's... But that's not, I'm not here to, to argue doctrine with you. I'm here to say uh, Ed, Ed Young Jr., the pastor's fellowship church in Grapevine, Texas, somebody asked him about election. He said, I don't know. I keep nominating them. God keeps electing them. That's all I know. I love that answer. But see, God wants us to declare His Word. He wants us... It's like Bishop and I were talking last night. We went, up, went by their house because he, he grilled some pork chops and had some extras. And he said, do you want them? And I said, uh-huh. So we went by the house and, and he, he gave them to us. And we were talking to him. And he's telling us about Sister Maxwell. And he says, uh, one of the men came up to him and said, Bishop, what's going on? What's happening? He says, I don't know. I don't know. He says, and I told him, I said, all I know is that we are supposed to pray for healing. I'm not supposed to pray, well, God, let your will be done. God's will is going to be done no matter if I pray it or not. But my job is to pray for healing. And it's God's job to heal them. Now, I can't answer why people aren't healed. I mean, that's what I prayed for my dad. God, heal my dad. We declare he is healed and he's whole. We did, but he died. 
And I don't understand why, because he was, such an, he was such an awesome man of God, and he was such a great father, and I don't know why he died at 69 years old, but that's not for me to understand. What I know is God is still God. He's still a loving God. He still cares for us. I don't, there's things that I, I can't comprehend. There's things in this world that I cannot comprehend. People say, I can't have a religion like that. I can't serve a God like that. Well, you don't understand physics. And it still happens. You can't understand everything that happens in this universe. But it still happens. There's got to be some mystery sometime. There has to be mystery or we will not live a life of hope and of, of reaching out for something. But God wants us to understand we've got, to, we've got power and we can destroy with our tongue. Remember the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me. I did a little research because I'm a geek and I like this kind of stuff. But the first mention of it was in a, a publication called Christian Report done by uh, the AME Church, African, African Methodist Episcopal Church, in 1862. And it says, the old adage says, so it's already, in 1862, it was already, so nobody really knows where it came from. But it's a falsehood because words can destroy it may not physically break your arm. It may not physically break your leg. But it will break your spirit. It will break your spirit. And I, I sense this morning, when I was praying this morning, I, I sense there are people that words have, just, have just, just pummeled their spirit. Just pummeled their heart. They have, they're, they're lying wounded from words that people have said. And, you know, there, there could be words that I've spoken that have wounded people. Unless they tell me, I don't know because I just, sometimes I'm, I'm goofy that way. I just say stuff and then my wife pretty much lets me know when I hurt her. Thank God. Not thank God I hurt her, but thank God she lets me know. Because I can't do any better, can't do any different unless I know. But we've got to understand that words do hurt. So we've got to be careful what we say. No matter who it is, no matter what situation it is, we've got to be careful because the power, the power in our tongue can destroy, but it can also create life. It can also create miracles. It can also do wonders because the Holy Spirit is hovering over that situation in your life. He's waiting for you to speak the powerful, miraculous power of the God into that situation. He's waiting for you to speak peace. He's ready to speak reconciliation. He's ready for you to speak joy. He's ready for you to speak hope. He's ready for you to speak His will into a situation so that you can he bring healing, so that He can come in and he can move in their lives. He can change situations. He can heal people's hearts. He can change people. Yes. Amen. Amen. It's, it's no use in us constantly bad-mouthing people because it's going to do no good but destroy our very spirit. Even if they don't hear the words, it destroys us. I mean, this is a trite saying, and everybody said it before, but it's like us drinking poison waiting for them to die. It's, it's ludicrous. We have to understand it's our responsibility as Christians to bring healing and reconciliation into that situation. It's our responsibility. I don't care how hurt it's make you. I don't it's made you. I don't care how bad they've done you. It's our responsibility to speak hope and life into a situation because that's who we are. We're life givers. We're hope carriers. We're peacemakers. God's created us to speak into this world and to speak his life into this situations. No, it feels good to the flesh to hold on to things. It feels good in the flesh to speak, to speak against them, to speak guile, to speak things, just little cutting things. And oh, that feels good just to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm here to tell you that's not what God wants us to do. Because when we, it goes against every fiber of our being to say good things in those situations. Because the the flesh wants to just get back and gets to, wants to just keep getting at them but I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit is just waiting I'm waiting on you I'm waiting on you I'm hovering over that situation I'm waiting on you to speak what God speak the will of God in that situation amen amen God wants us to speak life into a situation but unless you have the Holy Spirit Unless you are born again and have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you do not have the power to speak life. Because your master, 
the enemy is motivating you and all you want to speak is death. All you can speak. You can speak niceties, but you don't have the power-packed, Holy Spirit-backed word and authority to speak into a situation. Until you have been born again and received the Spirit of God, you cannot do that. And I have good news for those of you watching this morning, those of you that are hearing my voice. You can have that power. You can have that ability. You can have that resource. All you need to do is turn your heart over to Jesus this morning. All you have to do is turn your heart over. Whether you're, you're no matter who you are, where you are, what the situation is, God wants to empower you with words of peace, words of life, words of hope, words of joy. And if that's you this morning here in the house or online, and you want to know Jesus in this real way, He is so real. It's not some emotion. It's not some ethereal thing. It's not some crutch that we lean on. He is an empowering force that lives inside of us that can cause us to come rise above and be victorious he is a force to be reckoned with and He wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to, to be in relationship, an in intimate relationship with you so that He can be there for you and strengthen you. And if that's you this morning, you haven't received Him, you haven't given your life to Him, then it's my privilege to be able to help you do that. Because I'm going to just give you the words to say to start. You don't have to know how to pray. You don't have to know all this stuff. I'm going to give you one sentence and it'll be the starting point where you can start your journey. And if that's you this morning in the house or online, if you want to receive Jesus, if you'll just say this after me, just say, Jesus, I give you my life. That simple, just say, Jesus, I give you my life. With a sincere heart. If you prayed that prayer, I know that you've been born again. That you've entered into the relationship with Jesus. Again, that's not everything you'll ever have to say. It's not every conversation you and Jesus will ever have. There's going to be a lot to talk about. There's a lot that he wants to help you with. But it's the starting point. And that's all we need is a starting point. So if you did that this morning, I want to thank you so much because you're making the best decision in your whole life. The angels in heaven are rejoicing at that decision that you made. Now, if you've made that decision, please give me the opportunity to partner with you. Let me help you in this journey. If you go to our website or go to the comments or description of the video, click the I Just Received Jesus. Go to turnaround.church, I Just Received Jesus. Go to that link and fill out that information. Be sure to include your address. And I want to send you a book. It's called Ten Steps Toward Christ. And it'll help you on your journey. It'll be just like a guidebook that will help you on your journey in this life we call faith. So if you'll do that, fill out that information. And if you don't have a Bible, now you can get it on your device, on your phone, or on your iPad. It's called Version app, the Y-O-U version app. It's got all kinds of translations, got reading plans and that sort of thing. You can do that. Uh, or you can go buy your own Bible. But if you want one and you want us to provide one that we believe is one of the best readable versions and stuff, because there's reading plans in the, the Ten Steps Towards Christ. So just let us know in the comments section that you want a Bible and we'll send that to you. We'll drop ship it from Amazon right to you. And so there won't be a delay in it coming to you. And we'd be glad to do that. We're so glad that you joined with us. We're so glad that you made that decision today. And it makes my heart happy to know that someone else has the power, has access now to the power of the Holy Spirit inside their heart and in their life. And you can make those decisions, make those wise choices, and he'll guide you and he'll direct you. Amen, amen. Well, for those of you that want to help support the ministry, that want to give your tithes and offerings, want to support the ministry, we have several ways you can do that. Those of you in the house, you can go, there's uh, envelopes back at the back in the foyer is our offering receptacle. There's envelopes there if you want to put a check in there or cash, you can just fill out the envelope, put it in there. Those of you that are watching online, go to the Facebook page. You're on the Facebook page, more than likely go to the Shop Now button on our Facebook page. 
and it'll lead you to our giving platform. You can fill that information out. You can give, makes it that easy. Or you can go to our website, turnaround.church, to the giving button, or there's a link in the comments or description of the video, and you can give that way, fill out the same information. Or the, one of the easiest ways is how most everybody in the church does it right now, is just text the, the dollar amount that you want to give. So text the, whatever number you want to give. You don't have to put any words. You don't have to say anything else, just the number. And text that to 84321. 84321. And it'll send you a link back the first time. You fill out the information in the link. So the next time you give, all you have to do is type the number, hit send, and it's, it's, you've given. You'll get a, a thank you, and uh, you'll get a receipt. All right? And if you want to... If you just want to send us a check or a money order, you're, you want to do that, then you can send it to P.O. Box 1506, Cedar Park, Texas 78630. P.O. Box 1506, it's on the screen here, 78630. And you can do that. If you don't get that information written down before we go, then you can go to our website, turnaround.church, and get that information. All right? Don't forget, Wednesday nights we have our small group, and we do it via Zoom. And so we want to uh, invite you to join us if you want to. We have our small we meet, meet that way. Uh, it's still a, you know, it's virtual, but it's still a pretty intimate way. We can still talk to each other. Uh, in fact, we kind of got carried away this last Wednesday night and just kept talking and kept talking and kept talking. And uh, I keep saying, well, I want to let y'all go, but they were sitting in their house, so they didn't, weren't going to go anywhere, so we just kept talking. But if you want to do that, if you'll send, send us your email address to info at turnaround.church info at turnaround.church will get us your email address we'll send you a link to that meeting or you can send us a message through facebook or go to the contact us portion on our facebook on our website and send us any way you want to get it to us uh send a message homing pigeon however you want to get it to us get us your email address and we'll send that to you all right listen it's been such a blessing to have you with us we've been so excited to be in the house of god with you guys i always love coming together uh it was, uh, I told them, I said, when we came back together a few weeks ago, I said, next, the only t- time we're going to close again, and I'm saying this, you know, kind of being a mouthy person, but they're going to have to come shut the doors and carry us out. But I don't know if that's, it'll be that extreme. But anyway, I, we want to try to stay together because and, and, we want a fellowship in the house. We want to be together. Right now, all we can do is elbow bump. So that's not real intimate, but okay, we'll do that until we can hug and uh, shake hands and that sort of thing. But listen, we're so grateful for each one of you that are here. Those of you online, oh man, we're so, I'm so glad that you decided to take time to watch us. If you're watching us live or it's a repeat version, listen, we're grateful. So I want to bless you. I always like to bless you before we go. And so if you want to receive that blessing, if you'll just lift your hands this way. If you're online, if you just want to reach towards the phone or the iPad or the computer or the whatever you watch, if you're putting it on, casting it on your TV, whatever, just raise your hand towards the screen or towards this way. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. May you know that if God is for you, who can be against you? If God is on your side, whom shall you fear? May you be like a tree that's planted by rivers of living water that your leaf will not wither and whatever you do, it shall prosper. Bless you. We'll see you next time.